Hello to the attendees. We will get we will get started shortly. Okay, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are joining us from across the globe. Uh, welcome to the workshop on AI and HPC technology in semiconductor manufacturing presented by KLA in collaboration with IIT Madras. I'm Pradeep Ramachandran, Director and Head of Research at the AI Advanced Computing Labs at KLA. We also have with us uh, Rupesh Nasre from IIT Madras, who is uh, taking care of the National Science Mission for AI and HPC training, and several panelists, including Chris Bosker, senior fellow from KLA, with us uh, for this webinar. Before we get into uh, talking about the session, this workshop is being conducted as part of the National Science, uh, National Supercomputing Missions Nodal Center for Training in AI and HPC. And uh, Rupesh will say a few words about the mission itself. Rupesh. Rupesh, can you hear us? You're muted. Okay, uh, let me take over. I'm assuming the rest of you can hear me, Chris. Can you confirm? Yes, we can hear you, Pradeep. Okay, great. All right, so uh, I guess Rupesh is having some audio issues. Rupesh, one more try. Can you able to hear this? Okay, uh, then I should just continue. So uh, the National Science, the National Supercomputing Mission is essentially a mandate to create high performance computing manpower in India. And so as part of the National Supercomputing Mission, IIT Madras is recognized as a nodal center for training. And the website that you see on the right side is, uh, is the website that's actually hosted by IIT tracking all the various courses on high performance computing basics and workshops that have been conducted on special topics by IIT. Uh, there's been a significant industry connection for this training itself. There have already been lectures, a series of lectures by Qualcomm. There has been a workshop by ARM, both of which are actually linked from the website. And uh, the third in this journey has been this workshop by KLA. So when... Uh, Rupesh actually approached us with the idea of putting this workshop together. We thought about how to clearly demonstrate the fact that at KLA, we work on AI and HPC all the way from the application stack down till the nuts and bolts of the CPUs and GPUs. So uh, we put together this series of five talks, which will be kicked off by Chris today, talking a little bit about the problem space, talking about what we do with AI in the space of manufacturing, because this is, while it's a very important world, it's not a very well understood world. So we thought it will be best for Chris to actually explain the world uh, to all of us. And then George will take it up from there and talk about some of the challenges in actually adopting machine learning in manufacturing. Right? Uh, from there, Steve will talk on Wednesday, uh, speaking about how we build AI models in the fab, where he will connect what happens at the application level down to an infrastructure that we're building to make sure that you can do training and inference in the various fabs. The back end of the talk will be uh, going closer to hardware where we actually talk about much more about the HPC side of the things. So Mark will be talking about minimizing copy overheads while sharing GPUs on a box, which of course is one of the most important things to take care of because data copies are a very high overhead. This will be a talk on Thursday and I will bring it home in the end talking about how to run AI inference on CPUs what the recent developments are and why it's important. So, uh, like I said, we've laid this talk, this series of five talks out in a sequence. It's split across five days, one hour per day, so that you don't get tech fatigue from listening to all five of us talk on the same day. 
I would strongly encourage all of you to actually dial in for all five days so that you get a full flavor of how we actually work on AI and HPC technology at KLA. And uh, we sincerely hope that you have as much fun listening to these talks as we have had putting these talks together. Before we kick uh, get started, uh, a few logistics about the workshop that I want to uh, bring up here. All of you should have received a link to both the Zoom webinar and the live stream on YouTube. Please try to join primarily on the Zoom webinar. It can host a lot of people. We just created the live stream as a backup because you actually get the full experience, including Q&A, if you join via the Zoom webinar. Each session will follow a very similar pattern. We'll spend up to 10 minutes for introductions. We'll try to restrict the talk to 40 minutes after that, such that we have at least 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. The talks have been pre-recorded given the scale at which these uh, the number of registrations actually happened. We'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide, but the speakers will be available throughout the session of this one hour for each day. So as far as Q&A goes, please use the Q&A window in Zoom to post your questions at any time. Right. Some questions will be answered during the talk via typed responses, either from the speaker or from the other panelists. And a select few will be selected by the speaker and the panelists and answered live at the end by the speaker. If you're interested in a certificate of participation, I already saw a lot of questions that came up how uh, we'll actually get this. Please plan to attend at least 80% of all five talks. Right. Uh, we plan to take attendance using either Zoom, if you attend Zoom, Zoom has a nice uh, portal for us to take attendance here, or on YouTube, there will be actually a link to a Google form, which I will post after I'm done here with a pinned comment. So please make sure that you use the same name and the same email address that you had used for registration to either join the Zoom link or the Google form. Pradeep, before we get started, I just want to make sure I noticed some questions on the Q&A. Uh, I presume this is being, uh, I, there were some questions about whether other people could see the screen or whether they could hear the audio. So maybe Rupesh, can you confirm that you can see the screen and the audio? Yeah, I can see the audio as well as I'm able to hear. Okay, very good. Okay, thanks, Chris. Right, so, uh, so before we continue, it, it would be, very in, incomplete of me to not acknowledge the various people who have actually enabled us to be here today. We've received a lot of interest for this workshop, right? So we've received over 28,000 registrations. It's the largest scale that we have seen or heard of for such an event. And I'm actively seeing more than 3,000 participants who are actually joining on Zoom. And I can look at the statistics of the YouTube link. I have, uh, uh, I have a lot of viewers, more than 166 viewers on YouTube, right? So note that we are not a professional events team, that we are doing this as a bunch of engineers trying to put this together. So please don't mind small glitches uh, in these events. Hopefully it shouldn't be there. We've tried our best to make sure that we mitigate that. But if there are, please bear with us. We'll come back as soon as possible back online. Okay. And you know, really big thanks to many across KLA and IIT Madras who have enabled uh, us to show up here, right? I've worked with them over several weeks, over weekends, you know, bug them in the nights, days to really enable us to come here. This spreads across the HR team at KLA, corporate communication, the telecom team, the IT team, my management chain, all the speakers from KLA and, you know, those who help the speakers with their slides, their practice talks, and uh, particularly Vishal from IIT Madras, his connect team who enabled the LinkedIn post, Ricky, who is our resident TA for this uh, event, helping us with attendance activities. So really, we may appear tall here putting this workshop together, but there are these giants on whose shoulders we are standing to really be here today. Well, that said, uh, it's time to start your engines. Chris, any words before uh, get things rolling here? No, I think we're as... Uh... Pradeep mentioned what we did is we actually recorded this video uh, over the weekend because we saw so many registrants, but we'll try and uh, answer questions, some of the questions uh, while the recording is going on, but the main Q&A session will be after the talk, okay? Okay. Uh, Rupesh, anything to add? Because we couldn't hear you when we had the NSM bit. I did my best there. I hope that was okay. Anything more to add, Rupesh, that yes. I might have missed? 
So it looks good. Thanks a lot. All right, fantastic. Okay, then uh, I'm happy to kick off day one. September 27th, Monday, with the first talk of this series titled Modern AI in Manufacturing. Um, I'm delighted that Chris is the first speaker in this series. Chris is a senior fellow and VP of the AI Initiatives Group at KLA. Um, Chris's AI team leverages physics insights with data, algorithms to enable technology exploration. And the team has had several research programs with leading universities and vendors in both the AI and HPC space. Chris is a graduate from IIT Madras, and uh, you know he's really an expert all the way across the stack, right from your application space on AI and image processing, all the way down to the nuts and bolts of the CPUs and GPUs. And his teams have engineered pretty much most of the core software, the algorithm, and the parallel computing systems that are the heart of the KLA 10 core inspection system. So I'm delighted that Chris will be giving us an overview of the space and the various challenges that this space brings to us. So. That said, let me switch over to Chris's talk. Let's do a little bit of a setup here. And let's get rolling. Welcome. My name is Chris Baska. I'm Senior Fellow and Vice President at KLA. My group is responsible for research in high performance computing and AI and cloud technology. Uh, we are well honored to collaborate with IIT Madras in bringing this workshop and share our thoughts uh, on the convergence of AI, HPC, and the cloud. In particular, this week, we will talk a lot about the AI and HPC elements of this convergence. We're not going to talk a lot about the cloud, and we'll probably do that at a later time. Now, before I get started, uh, I want to acknowledge that these are really challenging times for all of us. So I wanna uh, wish all of you and your loved ones the best in these trying times. That being said, uh, human beings are eternally optimistic and forward looking. And so uh, the theme of this talk is about overcoming challenges uh, and we'll focus on the semiconductor industry. Uh, as we know, the semiconductor industry is uh, proven, in fact, during this pandemic, central uh, for our well-being, from our ability to work from home to communications. So it's really one of a, a vital piece in not only the uh, overall economy, but also it's playing a significant part in helping with the pandemic. So uh, the, what this talk is going to be about is uh, a fair amount about uh, manufacturing in semiconductors and how, the role of AI in it. Uh, but this is a very, very complex topic. In fact, semiconductor manufacturing itself is a very complex topic. And I'm reminded of the quote by the famous physicist Dirac. He was once asked uh, what he thought was the similarities and differences between poetry and physics. And Dirac, who was a man of few words, said, well, he considered physics goal as taking something that's very complex and making it simple and explainable. And then he thought that poetry was the exact opposite, that we would usually take simple concepts and make it very complicated. Of course, that was a joke that Dirac cracked. And uh, what I would like to kind of uh, talk about in the philosophy of this workshop is that we will try and keep things at an abstract level because there's so much complexity and we really will not be able to get through all the details. So keep that in mind. Abstraction is a very powerful concept and uh, the more abstract you can think about the concepts, uh, you'll be able to grasp them better. You'll also be able to apply it to other areas. Now, there are, uh, having said that, there's just a couple of caveats that I do want to say uh, while you think about questions in the question and answer session. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're aware that we are somewhat constrained by the kinds of things that we can reveal. Obviously, this is a very IP sensitive business, so we really can't talk a lot about things related directly to our customers. And then, of course, we can't talk a lot about what's gonna happen with our future products in that sense. But we will try and cover uh, essentially the fundamentals of what we need to do, okay? So, uh, this is the agenda. We're gonna talk about KLA's process control background. We're gonna talk a little bit about KLA AI systems, recent success stories, 
the lessons we've learned and uh, we look ahead to some challenges. So let's think about KLA's process control background. Now, one of the questions you may be asking yourself is why are semiconductors at this point in time uh, in such short supply that they're impacting you know, the global economy from you know, car plants being shut down because they're not able to access chips? Well, there are several reasons. One reason is the semiconductor process itself is very complicated. It has a very long pipeline delay. From the time you start an ingot of silicon to the time you actually uh, get a finished product, it could be six months. So there's a huge lag in terms of pure manufacturing. Now this of course assumes that you've already got a plant in place full of equipment and people and everything else to get going. However, keep in mind that if you want to start a new plant, a, a modern plant probably costs about more than $10 billion and it'll take about two or three years to construct. So you can see that the supply chain is going to have a challenge getting caught up if you need a lot of new demand, right? Finally, the semiconductor manufacturing process is widely distributed globally. It's designed often in the United States or somewhere else. And then the, uh, it's fabricated often in Asia. And then it's uh, bought to some other parts of Asia for testing. So all this is incredibly efficient when everything goes well. And of course, as we know, this, in this pandemic, we've had several challenges in that area. But I won't talk about the pandemic parts, but let, uh, let me just focus on uh, the key aspects of semiconductor manufacturing. So imagine a customer wants to go from five nanometers to three nanometers. What they will need to do is the reels are not going to be at the 80% levels at which they were at potentially at five nanometer. It'll be back down to five or 10%. It's like a game of, uh, you know, it reminds me of the game that I used to play when I was young of snakes and ladders and you would go all the way back down to zero. And that's what happens in semiconductor manufacturing. As you shift nodes, these nodes are very challenging and the yields collapse. So part of what we have to do is have to have the ability to ramp our customers very quickly, solve their problems. And once their problems are solved, we need to make sure that we can maintain them over there. In other words, a yield bust is a really bad idea. So how will our customers do this? Now, you know, as I mentioned, it takes about six months to make this electric circuit before you can electrically test it. And therefore, you need other methods in which you probe the system. You, you essentially have to do some, what we call process control or inspection and metrology and sample wafers during the manufacturing process. And that's essentially what KLA has pioneered in the industry. We really do two things. We uh, have two main product lines. One are inspectors and the others are metrology tools. And you can see the inspector's job is to find defects. And you can see them with SEM images on the left. And then on the metrology, you can see some cartoon of a 3D structure and you can see how we're making certain key measurements. Now, how are these things important? And let me try and put it in an abstract way in which a data scientist may be able to understand. The way to think about it is inspection is really about outlier detection, right? What you don't necessarily care about, uh, you know, getting everything. You, what you are mostly interested in is not the main uh, uh, lobe here, but you're interested in the tails because the tails are what are catastrophic. And this, those are not normal, right? So that's kind of what you want to do. So inspector, inspection is all about outlier detection. And uh, just as a, uh, to tell you that, uh, you know, how deeply ingrained this concept is, KLA first ever machine learning system with uh, defect classification was actually introduced in 1995 in the 2135. And our first deep learning based inspection system is our e-beam system that was introduced in 2018. So we've made a lot of progress, but what I want to tell you is KLA has actually been leveraging machine learning since the 90s. It's not anything new to us. We know this field very well. We have used traditional machine learning approaches, but we've also dabbled in neural networks in the 90s. And in fact, if you look at one of our systems, it's called a, uh, the FAST inspection system, Believe it or not, it actually had a neural network embedded inside the system because it worked really well. Now, in those days, neural networks were not very well received, so we didn't publicize it. 
Uh, but we've been actually doing neural networks for a long time. And uh, of course, in 2017, uh, we've really exploited deep learning to, uh, for, the, for uh, metrology. Let me briefly take a minute to explain the difference between metrology and inspection, therefore. Metrology is about throwing out, you don't really worry about the outliers now. You're simply worried about what the mean is and maybe what the variation is, right? So metrology is about measuring things that are in control and then you take those parameters and you feed it to the process equipment tools to make sure that their chemistry or optics, et cetera, is adjusted. So think of metrology as a runtime correction system and inspection is more related to looking at wafers at the end of every lot. You want to make sure that overall things haven't gone out of control. So th that's how these two things play, right? So if you want to think about KLA technology, and I'm going to now concentrate and look at the inspection technologies particularly, it's really built on three legs. Uh, KLA, in some sense, replaces the human eye in the semiconductor factory. So we take a full wafer, which might have 100 terapixels, and we scan it with some very high-end optics. The wavelength of these optics is often 200 nanometers. Just for reference, the wavelength of light is about 500 nanometers. So these are things that your normal eye cannot see. In fact, it would damage it. So these are very, very carefully controlled optics. And then of course, after the optics follows, we have, we have to scan it and get all the pixels, get all those 100 tera pixels into our system. And not only has it to be able to recognize things at that deep UV wavelength, uh, it also has to be able to run extremely fast uh, because it, we need to cover these 100 terapixels in about one hour. And then finally, of course, uh, the third leg is uh, once we've done this conversion, which is all happening in real time, we have to pipe this data into our computing system, which is built with our system. And that's really a lot of the focus of this talk, right? I'm not going to talk so much about the physics aspect. I'm going to talk more about the computation aspect. So this is what we refer to as a IMC stack. IMC stands for image computer stack. It's image computer because it's mostly promise, uh, processing images. And uh, one way to think about it is going back to the prior slide when I showed defects, uh, I showed both, uh, you know, there's, there are two different roles these days. Optical inspection systems don't have the resolution, but they have the speed. Their job is to detect, not necessarily resolve. And it's the job of the SEM to resolve defects. So that's kind of what happens these days. You can barely see the defect. Uh, you cannot resolve it. You can sort of see the defect of the optical system. And then you use the scanning electron microscope to verify it. That's a way of thinking about it. So this is kind of a very important concept that we use. And then, of course, what happens in all this is, you know, so you can see there's a, a thing with no defects. And then if something thins down, you can see the defect over there. So to process all this data, we have to take all the camera data and we do all our, we do some custom ASICs and FPGA processing in real time. We do some other vibration corrections and various other things again in real time, just to make sure that everything is perfectly aligned. And then comes the bulk of what I would say is our processing. We use highly parallel GPUs and CPUs and SIMD processing to construct uh, what would eventually be consumed by the, uh, the by the use, end user, and that end user might see a Pareto of defects. They may see some things saying, "Hey, this is a defect. This is this looks like noise," uh, or you know, they'll correspondingly have wafer maps. So, just to summarize this slide, uh, really think about our system as having optics, physics, and mechanics, and the images are formed, and a lot of the bulk images are formed by using optical processing. And then when you need very high resolution to, for verification, you go to certain places and you verify those defects using a SEN that's about a, one nanometer. The sensors on the optical systems can run up to 50 gigabytes a second. And then the computing stack, I, I just threw a number out there just to give you an idea that it might take only, you only have about 50 nanoseconds in every pixel to process it so that that gives you an idea that, you know, we have to do some very, very quick crunching. Having said that, our systems are throughput systems. They're not latency systems, even though the 50 nanosecond might appear like it's a latency system. 
it isn't we can we can essentially record the data and you know delay it and buffer it a little bit uh, so it's really a near real, real time system uh, and it's what we care are throughput uh, applications not necessarily uh, we don't have to find it uh, at the instance the pixel comes through but because the data rate is coming so high you don't have a lot of time you have to buffer some amount of data and if you overflow the buffer then you'll have a problem so we are kind of not late we are latency bound till the buffer but of course we are able to buffer a significant amount of data okay so this is how you want to think about our uh, systems so now we now switch gears and talk a little bit about some of our ai systems uh, that we've re recently built right so we've had really two examples one is our ebeam system uh, which is a revolutionary ebeam inspector and then an optical system that looks at uh, back end by back end it means it's just before it goes to the before the wafer is diced and it really is a very important system to, for no go no go type of systems and we are using it for uh, again reducing a lot of noise that comes out of these systems so these are two different examples one is an e-beam system the other is an optical system right and so in the uh, uh, looking at things what's going on is there's a lot of challenges that are going on in the IC world and one of the reasons we use an e-beam system for example is the e-beam system has to detect on the left what are called high high aspect ratio defects these are defects the way you can think of a transistor I mean a, a semiconductor IC is there's a transistor layer with you know billions of transistors and then you build a skyscraper on top to, for all the connections and that skyscraper with those lines, as these things are shown, you could have defects anywhere and you need to have some method of seeing it. And there's some very interesting properties that scanning electron microscopes can use to image those. So what does the ESL-10, our latest system, do? These first four columns sort of talk about the physics of what they do. Uh, you know, there's high beam current, wide op optics. Now these are electron optics simulations and Yellowstone which is for throughput so these are all the physics parts of what KLA does and then you'll see another column same artificial intelligence and here's where for the first time we have used a, in a significant part of the uh, of the processing chain deep learning to detect defects and so this is and I'll show you an example of that in up, right but before I do that so this is really a picture of the uh, first deep industry's first deep learning system. And its job is to isolate key defect of interest, DOI stands for defect of interest, from other defects and pattern noise. And, and as you can see, uh, uh, there's the inspection system here with these two cassettes where the wafers are loaded. And this is where all the physics and optics happens. And uh, if you want to see a little to the right, you'll notice where my mouse uh, cursor is, this is a stack that we, what we call our image computers and essentially it's a rack of servers with GPUs and it's powered by you know state-of-the-art NVIDIA GPUs right so that's uh, uh, that's the system that's how it looks uh, and this is sort of the finished system so now let's look at what why it's so powerful right now if you look on the left I'm really showing two images now one of the nice things about semiconductor uh, wafers is you know there's lots of them and they look identical so you can exploit that by going in and saying, hey, can I look at two sites that are supposed to be the same? And can I use those two sites uh, and you know subtract them as an example in the simplest mode and show that as an outlier defect? And that's kind of what this is doing. It's blinking two images and you know and there's a blown up version here and you can kind of see where the defect is. Now, you know, you can do that, but you'll also start showing lots of other false alarms here because you can see there's a lot of waviness here in this line and that comes about due to some quantum effects when uh, uh, you know when the semiconductor wafer is being made you know so there's natural variation and a lot of our traditional algorithms and these are very sophisticated traditional algorithms end up finding the signal but they end up finding a lot of nuisance also and that really overwhelms the system and this is where uh, some of the magic of deep learning has come in and uh, you know of course Remember that it's not just purely deep learning. We use deep learning in conjunction with knowledge about our physics. And that's how we managed to make some of these things work. So it's really what we term as physics-based AI. 
Now, the, there is a similar story happening in an optical inspector and there there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the inspector detects things and we use it in the classification mode. And so what happens is the inspector is detected, it's spinning, spitting out a lot of nuisances and you can't separate out naively. You can see these different color dots means there are two different defects of two different types and the black dots represent the nuisance. And so what this deep learning engi uh, engine defect wise was able to do was very nicely able to go into this complex area where we originally, with traditional algorithms, could not separate it out. It was able to easily remove it out and we were able to retain it. And so this is one of the advantages of deep learning is because of its nonlinear structure, it's able to build a lot more complex boundaries. Now the problem, of course, with deep learning, and I'll allude to some of the challenges, is that same power is also its weakness because nonlinearity is not something that is easily explainable to human beings. So, you know, one has a challenge when we look at that. Okay. So now uh, let me switch gears quickly and talk about some of the lessons we've learned and some of the challenges. So uh, some of the important things in all this is it's easy to get carried away with looking at just the deep learning algorithms and the neural networks and its architecture. Because at the end of the day, it's the software stack that makes the whole system work. And so for example, a large part is how do you make sure the, you follow the 80-20 rule of data science and manage data. On Wednesday, I believe Steve Espenshade is going to talk a lot more about this. And some of the systems that Steve and his team have architected and built have been essential for our success because uh, you know, they allow our data scientists and engineers to run experiments much more quickly. And so the 80-20 rule really says most 80% of the time data scientists are waiting for data, 20% of the time they're doing algorithms. So having a good infrastructure is really crucial. Second element, as I mentioned, is you can't just simply say, I'm going to believe, uh, leverage deep learning for everything. Uh, I'll give you a simple example in computer vision. If you are doing some scene recognition, uh, you could leverage the fact that the sky is blue, assuming that your camera is, of course, tilted in the uh, correct direction. And maybe you don't want to uh, bother about, uh, uh, you know, you can leverage that fact when you're doing seg semantic segmentation. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't use it, then you'll, you'll have to spend a lot more power or training those systems to recognize that the sky is blue. So the, there are simple rules to input which are quite robust. You should do it. Uh, third, uh, we're not going to talk a lot about it, but cloud-based infrastructure with containers and all makes a lot of development easy, easier, particularly when you do high heterogeneous computing with GPUs, right? So these are really crucial uh, things. Uh, number three and four is you really do need to be able to convince people that these things work. And I'll get to one of the reasons why, because, uh, you know, it's not intuitive as to what these systems are doing. So there's a lot of suspicion that people may have that it's not really based on true uh, physics principles. Uh, finally, you've got to invest in uh, training in human capital because if you don't do that, then uh, you're not going to be able to leverage uh, deep learning and machine learning. Some of the challenges that AI and HPC have is this convergence that is happening is happening, but the convergence is hard, right? Uh, you have to be clear which parts of technology from these different areas you want to include. So you might want to use Docker containers, but you may want to think twice about whether you want to use microservices. They may or may not be appropriate. Remember microservices built for the cloud. The KLA systems tend to run on-prem inside the fab and microservices uh, might be good if you're geographically distributed for development purposes, but they may not be appropriate for things inside a fab or inside some industrial setting. You just have to think about it. There may be, but you know, we think there are some challenges at least for our application stack. Uh, you also have to worry about security, IP and data leakage issues, right? See, these things are there and you cannot be naive about them. You have to also balance, uh, you know, your new approach with some proven approaches. Manufacturing flows don't necessarily like rapid changes. They also want long life components. These fabs are gonna be run, running for 20 years. How do you make sure that 20 years from now, a particular brand of Intel CPU or NVIDIA GPU will be available, right? So you have to make sure that you plan for it. Training may also be data limited because you know customers have a limited amount of data which they may be willing to give you. So you have to make sure 
that your systems are robust. And then uh, an important point is something called covariate shift. It's a term that means that the distribution of data when you train looks a little different from the distribution of data when you're running in production. There's been some sort of shift. How do you make sure that your models are robust? And this is again why physics-based AI is important because you have to be able to leverage the combination of some stable assumptions which come from physics rules, geometry, and of course data because you know maybe uh, you have a very complex noise situation, right? So that's that's one way of thinking about it. Uh, lastly, it comes down to explainable models. And as I mentioned, here's where the power of deep learning is there. It's nonlinear. And we know there are theorems that prove that virtually any kind of complex function can be expressed by a neural network. But it requires nonlinearity. And honestly, that is one of the roadblocks because the more nonlinear a model becomes or leverages nonlinearity, the harder it is for human beings to comprehend and understand. We are very good at understanding linear uh, things that function linearly. We're not so good uh, at comprehending things that are nonlinear. And it's a little bit of a philosophical challenge to overcome that barrier. Uh, and in fact, if you think about it, most nonlinear systems are often made with piecewise linear solutions. So there's a lot of research going on in this area but it's by no means uh, a solved problem. Now, uh, with that in mind, I'm going to kind of summarize what's going on here in terms of the concepts. It's, there are three keys for success. One is algorithms, which we, again, firmly believe is based on physics-based AI. And then the other two pillars are accelerated computing and the software infrastructure. And again, here I've got a little diagram that shows uh, you take historical data, you, on the right side, you use all your human knowledge, every, physics, you know your constraints, and you leverage it. Uh, you know the sky is blue, you know the wafers have got repeating patterns, you know uh, something about your optics and your physics. And there's a lot of conventional algorithms which are very powerful, you shouldn't abandon them. On the other hand, you have fresh new methods, when these guys break down, these guys are able to really uh, work extremely well. And when you fuse these two together, uh, we believe this sort of architecture is the most robust uh, uh, sort of architecture that one can use, certainly in the industrial setting. So with that, I'm gonna switch gears now to uh, the accelerated computing leg. I've talked about this We've talked a little bit about the physics, but I'm gonna spend most of the rest of my time talking about the accelerated computing leg. So uh, this is a busy diagram, and uh, what it represents is four kinds of algorithms that are commonly used in a lot of scientific computing. So we have deep learning networks here, which are neural networks. We have traditional image processing algorithms, where you have images, you can do alignment, you can do normalized cross-correlation, you can do edge detection, you all do traditional feature extraction over here. In this corner, there's a lot of linear algebra kind of work going on, principal components analysis, single value decomposition, you solve some solvers, normal equations, and then there's all kinds of physics simulations, FTDT, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that are, put in these corners. Now, why have we put these things in four different taxonomies? We put them in four different taxonomies because our inspectors usually operate on the top level and our metrology tools often operate in the bottom level, but that, that's just a, you know, a simplest, simplified assumption. But another reason is these are different loads. So for example, a GPU or a, a computing, um, it's well publicized that they're about five to 15 times, uh, in fact, often higher than CPUs. That's why GPUs are significantly used for training deep learning, learning networks and also for inference. Traditional image processing uh, tends to, uh, GPUs tend to run three to six times faster than traditional CPUs. Uh, and then these things, uh, the, the performance between the GPU and CPU is less. Often the load is very large, you have very large images, they may not fit completely into the GPU. And these are bandwidth limited. So you, you, know, you, you end up 
having to use CPU and GPU together quite a bit. Whereas on these top two rows, you can pretty much take a good chunk of the problem, give it to the GPU, it'll do its processing and you can come back. So the moral of the story is, today we believe that GPUs are winning significantly because they have a lot more, particularly when you have more arithmetic intensity. On the, so the GPU times more compute and they also have more bandwidth. And this, and uh, you know, I'm sure if you've taken a class in Professor Nusre's GPU class, he will explain that well to you. But it doesn't mean you get it all the time, right? CPUs are caches, CPUs are more latency bound systems. Uh, so if you've got latency related applications, CPUs will do better. If you've got throughput applications, then uh, you know, uh, GPU architecture is better. And it turns out that for our application, it's more of a throughput application. So you have to use uh, SIM, SIMT, SIMD kind of processing. And that's why we tend to use uh, a lot of those. So the, uh, another uh, way to think about this uh, very quickly is the GPUs have, they're in the early stages, stages of parallel computing adoption, right? So if you look at this axis, it goes from, uh, more general purpose to less general purpose, right? So the more general purpose is of course what the CPU is and the less general purpose is in this axis. And, and so you can see that GPUs, for example, have added matrix multiply tensor cores. Now that's not a general purpose computing system, but if it turns out that like 90% of your computing needs that, you add that piece of silicon and it becomes very useful. Now you might choose to have far fewer of that in your mobile phone because you know, mobile phones are battery limited and it, they may not be that advantageous, right? The other area that you can look at, of course, are simply parallelism. You can put more cores, you'll get, you'll get to you'll be able to stamp out more copies. And it turns out in general, you can stamp out more copies uh, on GPUs. Lastly, you can also exploit this axis, which is, uh, and a lot of people are doing it, particularly for inference. That is, you can use lower precision and the lower precision, it turns out these neural networks are very robust and they, they, they tend to generalize well. And as a result, you could use lower precision and that leads to more better performance, right? Now, having said all this, you have to remember that these GPUs are subject to arithmetic intensity. If you have a scenario where there's a lot of computation, that's great. So if you're on this side, uh, you, you know, you will win. And However, whether you're on the CPU or GPU, uh, if you're bandwidth limited, then you could run into a problem, right? So you really have to know where you are. And uh, very often for many, many loads, uh, people are often on the left side of things, right? Therefore, you don't actually ever quite get the theoretical peak flops that people expect. All right, so uh, that's just to set, set some stage that leads to where uh, you know things are in the next few years. There are lots of choices. Everybody, of course, knows about the market leader, NVIDIA, uh, but they're not standing still. They're, they've got publicly announced products that uh, look like they're going in the direction of more closer, tighter integration with CPU and GPU. Uh, AMD has their CDNA uh, architecture. They've had GPUs for a long time. They haven't been as programmable as NVIDIA's, uh, but they are racing to catch up on that front. Uh, and they have some very interesting, uh, uh, you know, architectures. They've got uh, the chiplet architecture. They seem to be ahead in that space. And then uh, Intel, of course, is not uh, staying still. They've got the Ponte Vecchio, and they believe that they will soon have market leadership in this. So that's, that's the landscape. It's a very interesting landscape. Uh, the question one has to ask is, does the best hardware GPU win or is the is it the one with the best software ecosystem or is it some combination of the two only time will tell and we'll see how the next few years play out but it's an in, very interesting and exciting spot at least as far as gpus are concerned now in addition to gpus of course for deep learning you might have seen that there's a lot lot more uh, activity in accelerators uh, space not just uh, these four uh, G, these three vendors there are numerous vendors popping up from Cerebrus who are doing wafer scale processing to other companies like Samba Nova 
and many others like GraphCore. Now, of course, they're all in their early days of infancy and they each seem to be looking at some particular niche. And perhaps you have a niche application where they could really benefit. In that scenario, they might make sense. But overall, the GPUs and CPUs are a little more general purpose. And you know, if your algorithms are not completely stable, you might want to wait a little bit until you jump completely into uh, an architecture which is very, very specialized. Okay, so let's look ahead. Uh, I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about uh, where things could be going, right? One interesting uh, dilemma in all this is the GPUs and the SIMD, whether it's vector AVX, in fact, Pradeep will be talking about CPU SIMD programming later in the week. Mark will talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges and how you get data. At the end of the day, it requires a sort of intimate knowledge of the architecture of the system. And uh, that's what Professor Uday Bondagula at IISC, who is one of the world's leading experts on polyhedral compilers, uh, has got some uh, really interesting uh, insights on saying, look, there's an explosion of chips and there's an explosion of frameworks. How do we make sure that uh, you know, uh, what the state of the art systems all seem to require real ninja programmers and can we do better? And there appears to be some evidence that the, uh, the approach of, uh, uh, sorry, the, excuse me, the approach of uh, uh, MLIR compilers seem to um, get you somewhere. Uh, so let's think about the slippery slope, which I've talked about, uh, you know, one of the things that we in KLA care about, right? So what happens is very often a KLA engineer or a data scientist, he, you know, writes a high level program in Python or maybe even C. I've, just for illustration purposes, I've shown the Sobel Edge Detector. For those of you who've got an image processing background, you can go and check it out. It's a very simple, uh, but very, very robust edge detection module. And it's something that's actually understandable, right? It's, uh, you know, if you understand Python, you can fairly quickly understand what it's doing. You can also do the same thing in MATLAB. Now, what happens typically is after, let's say that algorithm looks useful and usable. What happens is we probably want to run much faster because we have a lot more data to process. Now, we aren't quite ready to commit to this algorithm yet at this point, uh, but we want to look at the whole wafer. So maybe with our next stages, we go and can have work with somebody and they convert it to C code. Now that allows us to do the next stage, uh, but uh, it's, uh, you know, you can see the, uh, it's still understandable. Uh, but it's not as understandable as the Python code. And then finally, uh, once we decide we really like it and we want to ship it to the products, we have to do this ninja level programming where, in fact, I think uh, Pradeep will be talking about SIMD programming and I've shown an example of x86 SIMD programming. It almost looks like assembly language programming. In fact, you have to use intrinsic. So you have to have a very intimate knowledge of how things work in SIMD land. That's great if you're a ninja programmer. It's not that great if you, for ordinary mortals. Now, in, in KLA, we take a very pragmatic view. We believe that for the next several years, ninja programmers absolutely essential for a couple of reasons. They, that's the only way to really get performance. But also the insights that the ninja programmers have will help people like Uday uh, eventually build compilers that can get uh, faster and faster, right? So uh, I showed that part, but you know, what I also wanted to show is another problem. Here is the GPU histogram code. These are for, uh, an example of CUDA. And then what turns out is if you're doing a fused histogram, uh, the, the code looks even worse, right? Because so maintainability now becomes a real challenge. So these are some of the challenges we believe uh, over the next few years that we are gonna have to tackle, right? Uh, you know, most real world algorithms are not compute bound. Multiple kernels have to be fused together to reduce memory bottlenecks. And then your original code intent sort of vanishes, right? So this is kind of what we all want. We want the kind of things that uh, Dr. Uday has, uh, you know, articulated, which is, uh, and there's some evidence that these kind of things work because uh, their XLA and TVM are two compiler technologies. I actually believe there was a talk last year at, uh, the HP, at the HPC workshop by the good folks from Synopsys or uh, 
I, I think it's a synopsis or uh, probably Qualcomm uh, talked about a TVN and that's a very interesting area. And XLA is Google's version of uh, uh, TVN. And then MLIR, of course, is, a, is a, an infrastructure that's enabling a lot more of these. So I just wanted to give you a sense here about where, the, where we think uh, there are some very interesting areas to mine. It's not clear that all of these will work, but they certainly look like interesting research areas. And then another area that we think is going to be important is modern C++. Uh, it's not your grandfather's C++. It, uh, there's been a lot of changes for very positive changes. Uh, there are also some challenges because there's, it, uh, it is such a complex language. Uh, you could very easily get into difficulties. Having said that, uh, if you look at all the major players, whether it's Google, uh, whether it's uh, Intel or whether it's NVIDIA, they are putting a lot of resources in modern C++. And you have to understand and learn that from us. You know, you have to unlearn some things uh, from regular C++ or the way it was done so that you can write some very performant code. So this is another area that we think uh, is going to be really interesting. So in conclusion, uh, let me say a few words. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be working in the space of the intersection of AI, HPC, and the cloud. Uh, semiconductors, as you guys know, are becoming an even more critical part of the global economy. And then what KLA score of semi semiconductor inspection metrology really requires is cutting edge AI and HPC technologies to keep, uh, to, to ensure that our customers are able to progress their, uh, you know, bringing out more and more advanced chips. I'd like to say a few words about KLA and IITM. We've had an active research collaboration since 2003. And the next phase is really this India Advanced AI Computing Lab, which is located in the IIT Madras Research Park. It's going to enable numerous more opportunities for faculty uh, collaboration and for, for internships uh, and other opportunities, right? So if you have, uh, you know, if you like what you see this week, uh, do make sure that you contact Pradeep. Uh, you know, he'll give you all the contact information, whether you're a faculty member, whether you're a student in interested in internship, or perhaps you might even be interested in employment at KLA. So I hope uh, that sort of overview was uh, uh, useful for you, and I look forward to uh, answering questions. Okay, um, thank you very much, Chris, for that wonderful talk. It was really insightful. So we'll dive into a few questions out of the several questions that we've received in the Q&A session. Before I uh, post a few questions for Chris to answer, I just want to uh, kick this off by talking a little bit about questions about attendance and uh, getting a certificate and to get slides and recordings. So just to reiterate, if you have attended on Zoom, and you have attended with more than 80% of the duration of this session, you have already been marked as available for this session. To get certified, please make sure to do so for all five sessions of the workshop. If you attended on YouTube, uh, there is a form that is in a comment that's pinned in the YouTube stream. Please fill that form out using the same name and email address as what you had used uh, to register for the workshop. In case, the name that you've used in the Zoom session is different from the name that you'd use for registration or the emails differ. Please go to the YouTube stream before the session closes and fill it out with the right specs. And that way you get attendance. And we'll also make a PDF version of the slides and the recording of the talks available after the workshop is completed. And you'll hear specs about that in your registered email. Okay. So now that being said, I have a few interesting questions that I want uh, Chris to take. Chris. Uh, first question, there's been a lot of questions about IMC. So maybe you can clarify a little bit about what an IMC is. Yeah, sure. So if you, you know, I think I alluded to the fact that what KLA does you know, is kind of replace the human eye in the semiconductor fab, right? So you see that big picture of the wafer as a, on my background. That wafer uh, is imaged with our optics. And so when we create images, we literally create images. It's similar to how images are formed at the back of your retina when you are looking at a scene, right? 
Instead, what we're doing here is we're using a microscope and the microscope goes uh, over the wafer. There's a stage that scans the entire wafer. And so images are actually created, right? Of course, the images by themselves are not very interesting to the customer unless we do some processing on it and end up with what we call defects, right? So that's essentially the essence of what our inspection systems do. They look at every pixel and they're making, they have like 20 or 50 nanoseconds to make a decision on whether something's a defect or not, right? Now, because it's this 50 nanoseconds or very small amount of time, we need to pro we need a lot of compute power to process these decisions. So to reiterate, what we do is we use very sophisticated algorithms to decide whether something's a defect or not. Sometimes those algorithms might include uh, neural networks, right? They also include a lot of traditional image processing, but that's what the term image computer means is I could do these algorithms, but I wouldn't be able to keep up with the speed if I didn't have a stack of computers there. So IMC stands for image computer. Great, thanks Chris. Uh, there's also been a few questions to clarify what CPU SIMD means. We are yeah, top level answer. You, you can probably answer that better than me, uh, Pradeep. But so the what happens is most I, most CPU instructions, the way they operate, tend to be sequential. That's how we think about it. But the CPUs have an, a special architecture that allows multiple instructions to execute at once. So on images, if you can think about images. All images are sort of identical in the sense that they are similar data structures, right? So you could take a block of 16 images, 16 pixels, and you could say, okay, I want to do the same operation on all of them. I want to do addition or subtraction on all of them to get together. And you can do it in one clock cycle. So that is called single instruction, multiple data. And maybe you can elaborate better on that, Pradeep. Yeah, so exactly. Right? So basically the idea is that you have several data elements on which you want to do the same operation like Chris mentioned. And in image processing, it's very common that you have a big image with whatever 32 by 32 or even up to 1024 by 1024 pixels. And you want to say, you want to blur something or you want to apply the same filtering operation on all pixels. So the operation, that's the instruction is the same, but the data is different. So that's why it's SIMD or single instruction, multiple data. If you want to hear a little bit more, I'll plug in for my talk. Please dial in to the talk on Friday where I'll talk a little bit more about SIMD and its lineage. Uh, Chris, next question to you uh, comes from Renuka. How will quantum computing affect the current AI techniques in manufacturing? Okay, so I can talk a little bit about it. I'm not an expert by any means on quantum computing. Quantum computing uh, is a emergent field there's a lot of research work going on. Uh, people who are interested can probably uh, uh, pay attention to the work done by Professor Anil Prabhakar at IIT Madras. But quantum computers are at this point, I would say very much in the uh, research lab stages, right? They are not in by any means uh, available made to solve any mainstream problem. The way to think about a quantum computer is in, in a simplistic way is in a conventional computer, you have bits, zeros and ones. In a quantum computer, you have something called a qubit where all the states you have, you, you have a superposition of zero and one. It goes back to the fundamental laws of physics. And for certain kinds of applications, it can run incredibly fast because you can process everything at once. But again, one has to be very careful. So for example, you can do something like factoring a number, a prime number very fast with a quantum computer. This has been proven theoretically. Uh, however, uh, what there is a drawback in quantum com computers is eventually you need to be able to do what's called IO. And when you do IO, the quantumness uh, of that system collapses, it becomes a, uh, a classical computer. So my summary would be quantum computers would be very useful for solving very complex physics problems because that's what nature does. So they can simulate, uh, you know, what a complex mo molecule can do, something we can't do very well with our systems. They can probably uh, solve very difficult cryptography problems. Uh, but so they will be complementary. And plus, these things will only exist in the cloud. Uh, I'll give you an example. The, some of these quantum computers have to exist at sub milli Kelvin temperatures, right? So you're not going to be able to put them in your pocket. It can only exist in the cloud. 
So it will be a highly complementary technology to conventional computing. So conventional computing will com continue for a long time. And my personal opinion is quantum computers only emerge for anything useful probably towards the end of the decade, but it's a very exciting area to be involved in. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Okay, take Chris, thank you very much. I think that's about all the questions that we can take, given that we are at the hour already. I want to thank Chris again for taking the time for the talk. Thank all the panelists for attending. And all the participants, we have over 3,300 attendees who showed up on Zoom and over 250 of you who showed up on YouTube. Really appreciate you dialing in. And uh, looking forward to see you all again tomorrow, where we'll hear George talk about AI, uh, the challenge of leveraging AI in manufacturing. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Thank you.